In this video, we're going to look at a new type of series called a power series. It's written in the form of c sub 0 plus c1 times x plus c2 x squared plus c3 x cubed and so on. You just have a number of coefficients called, I'm sorry, a number of coefficients times powers of x. And yes, those uh, c numbers, they are constants, and they are the coefficients. Uh, for any fixed value of x, then we can use one of our tests to determine if the series is convergent or divergent. And in that way, we can look at f of x equaling this power series as a function. And the domain of the function would be the set of the values of x where the series is convergent. And yes, it looks like a polynomial, right? It looks like a polynomial with infinitely many terms. So a very simple power series is when we let all of the coefficients equal one. And this is a geometric series. And we know its domain or its interval of convergence is when the absolute value of x is less than one. So anything in the open interval from negative one to one will lead to a convergent power series. Uh, note that some or most of the coefficients could even be zero. So if I had a polynomial expression, like 3x to the power of 4 minus 5x cubed plus 2x squared minus 8x plus 12, I could consider that as a power series. My c sub 0 is the constant term 12. c sub 1 is the multiplier times x. c sub 2 is the multiplier times x squared. And so on up to c sub 4, where I have the multiplier times x to the power of 4. But there are no terms beyond x to the power of 4. So then I would consider all of the higher coefficients to be 0. Most of the power series we look at are going to be centered at zero, but you could center it at any real number. So what would that mean by centering it? You're just going to shift all of the terms uh, so that the center of that term is at A. And so we'll replace X with parentheses X minus A. So let's look at some examples. We already saw with the geometric series, or when all the coefficients are identically equal to one, that uh, the series is convergent for any value of x between negative one and positive one, excluding the endpoints. Well, what about this power series? My coefficients are n to the power of n. Well, a good test would be the root test, because we have something to the power of n. So if I take the nth root of the absolute value of n to the power of n times x to the power of n, I just get n times the absolute value of x. I can take the n outside of the absolute value signs, because n is always positive. I don't need absolute value signs around any factor with n in it. But now if I let uh, n go to infinity, that's just going to go to infinity, no matter what I have for x, except x equaling 0. So the only time that this uh, power series converges is when x equals 0. Let's look at a different one. Here, I have uh, x to the power of 2n. Well, that's fine. That just means that I only have even powers of x. And so I would consider all of my odd coefficients to be 0. So the 
numerator is x to the power of 2n, the denominator is n factorial. So when I see an n factorial, one thing I want to try is the ratio test. Now, I don't need absolute values here because I only have even powers of x. And if I take any number and raise it to an even power, I'll always get a positive number. So this series only has positive terms, no matter what value of x you put in there. So let's go ahead and simplify this fraction. And I'm left with x squared over n plus 1. And as n goes to infinity, that is going to go to 0, no matter what value of x I put in there. And so this power series is convergent for all values of x, or all real values of x, all values of x on the real line. Let's look at this example, where in the numerator, I just have x to the power of n. In the denominator, I have n to the power of 4 times 4 to the power of n. I might want to try the uh, root test here, but I'm going to stick with the ratio test. So I do need the absolute value signs here, but really they only come on the terms or the factors that have x. Uh, because why? Uh, n to the power of 4, 4 to the power of n, all of those are all positive numbers. So I can simplify that, and I'm left with n to the power of 4 over n plus 1 to the power of 4. Now I'm not showing all the details, and it's okay at this stage in the class that you appreciate that as n goes to infinity, this term is going to 1. Um, really, you don't need calculus um, explicitly to, to come to that result. Uh, a good algebra student would be able to, to state that as well. So we're going to just going to say that this is going to 1, which means that as n goes to infinity, we're left with absolute value of x over 4. Now remember, this is the ratio test. So we want absolute value of x over 4 then to be less than 1, to guarantee convergence. Which means, of course, that absolute value of x should be less than 4. So as long as x is in the open interval from negative 4 to positive 4, the ratio test guarantees convergence. Now we can make no conclusion from the ratio test when the absolute value of x over 4 equals 1, which means that we have to test the endpoints here when x equals negative 4 and x equals positive 4 using some other test. So that's not too bad. That's not too much work. I can just replace x with positive 4. And in that case, I'll get 4 over n over 4 over n. That'll divide to make 1. And I get a convergent P series. So the power series is convergent when x equals 4. What about when x equals negative 4? Well, negative 4 to the n over 4 to the n simplifies to be just negative 1 to the n. And this is a convergent alternating series. And so in the end, I find that x can be in the interval in the closed interval from negative 4 to 4, and the power series will be convergent. So this is pretty common where we can use the ratio test or the root test to determine convergence everywhere except for at the endpoints of an interval. And then we need to use some other test. In this case, we use the p-test and the alternating series test. Uh, to determine the convergence at the endpoints. And it could be that you get, in, like we have in our case, both endpoints are convergent or lead to a convergent power series. You may have only one, 
or you may have neither. It's just something you have to test in each case. So these examples illustrate the following theorem, that if I have a power series, really there's only three possibilities with respect to convergence. Either the power series converges at only one value, which is the center of the power series, or the power series converges for all x, or you have a positive number r such that the power series converges when the absolute value of x minus a is less than r diverges when the absolute value of x minus a is greater than r. So the way we should understand that is the power series is guaranteed to converge when x is less than r units from the center. And it's guaranteed to diverge when x is more than r units away from the center, either on the left or the right. This number, capital R, is called the radius of convergence. So for our first case, we would call the radius of convergence zero. And then for the second case, where the power series converges for all x, we'll just say that the power series has an infinite radius of convergence. A power series also has an interval of convergence. So in the first case, where we only have one number where the power series is convergent, we would have a closed interval where whose left endpoint and right endpoint is that same number, the center of the power series. In the second case, it's the interval of convergence is the entire real number line. And then in the third case, we really have four possibilities. The radius of convergence guarantees that on the interior of that interval, uh, you're going to have uh, convergence. But at each endpoint, you may or may not be convergent. So we could have an interval of convergence where it does not converge at the left endpoint, but it does converge at the right endpoint. Or maybe it converges at the left endpoint and not at the right endpoint. Or maybe it converges at neither endpoint, or maybe it converges at both endpoints. Let's look at another example. We are told that this power series centered at zero converges when x equals four and diverges when x equals six. And based on that information, we'd like to determine which of the following are convergent. So I just have the power series of the coefficients. So let's think about this. We know that the radius of convergence should be at least four because it converges when x equals four. But it must be smaller than six because it diverges when x equals six. And actually, I should say that uh, uh, it could be equal to six, right? Because um, six could be an endpoint uh, and maybe it converges when x equals negative six or not. Um, but for our, our questions, uh, it's, we can just say that r is uh, no larger than six. Well, in this particular power series, it looks like we're only summing up the coefficients, but that is, is what we would do when x equals one. And so this is our given power series with x equal to one. And since one is smaller than four, uh, the series is converging. In part B, it's clear that x equals eight and eight is definitely bigger than six. And so the series will diverge. In part C, I have 
negative 1 to the power of n times c sub n times 3 to the power of n. Well, I can combine the 3 to the power of n with the negative 1 to the power of n and write that as c sub n times negative 3 to the power of n. So we see that really this is our given power series with x equals negative 3. And negative 3 is in the interval between negative 4 and positive 4. So this series is convergent. All right, let's look at one more example. We like to find the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence of this power series. Uh, the terms have x to the power of n in the numerator and radical n times 6 to the power of n in the denominator. Again, I could probably use the root test, but I am going to stick with the ratio test. I do need absolute values, but I went ahead and just put the absolute values on the x because everything else is a positive term. So uh, let's do some simplification here. And I get radical n over radical n plus 1. I can write that as the radical of the fraction n over n plus 1. And I know as n goes to infinity, that fraction goes to 1. And so radical 1 will give me 1. So as n goes to infinity, this goes to absolute value of x over 6. Again, we're using what? The ratio test. So to guarantee convergence, I want the absolute value of x over 6 to be less than 1. Or the absolute value of x should be less than 6, which tells me that the radius of convergence is 6. Now to find the interval of convergence, remember the ratio test doesn't tell me anything when the limit equals 1. So if the absolute value of x were to equal 6, I can't use any conclusion from the ratio test. So I'll need to check each endpoint separately. So let's start with the right endpoint, x equals 6. When I replace x with 6, I'll have 6 to the power of n in the numerator and in the denominator. And those will divide to make 1. And so I'm left with a divergent p series. So x equals 6 is not in the interval of convergence. What about x equals negative 6? Well, when I replaced x with a negative 6, I have negative 6 to the power of n over 6 to the power of n. And that can be simplified to negative 1 to the power of n. And now I've got a convergent alternating series. I could use the alternating series test to conclude that this series is convergent. So x equals negative 6 is in the interval of convergence. So my interval of convergence is closed on the left and open on the right.